Kelly, sorry for a little bit of a delay and a little glitch. We've got one of our folks who are having a little bit of a computer problem. And so we were trying to adjust that ahead of time before we let you in. And you know how things like that happen. So we're happy to have you here, of course, with the Garden Hour with MU Extension. Just as a reminder, we only have one more week today and next week where we're doing this on a weekly basis. And then we're going to go to a monthly basis. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to still be here in order to answer your questions, um, just simply because we enjoy what we do. We like sharing our information. And then a lot of times we don't actually know some of those answers and we go research them for you. And then we gain information as well as you gaining information. So that's a, a, one of the things about this job that I really, really enjoy is that I am always continuously learning because horticulture is such a vast industry um, and we know that. What I'd like to do is show you the map that we have here of all of the folks that are uh, working currently with MU Extension as a horticulture specialist. We do have a couple of spots that are open and we're in the process of trying to get those hired. And as we do, we'll continue to populate this map. So you can pick your um, local county extension office uh, or the local county horticulture person that you would like to have uh, to answer a question if you've got one. And if you're in a county where there isn't one, by all means, feel free to go ahead and reach out to any one of us. It doesn't make any difference because we do cross uh, those boundary lines and we're happy to, to have you um, ask those questions. What I'd like to do right now is I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. I'm gonna turn it over to Zach um, and he is going to go ahead and do our weather report for us. So I'm sure he has some fun and interesting things he's gonna share with us today. Yes, thank you, Debbie. And I'm excited uh, for this week's uh, weather summary because I come bearing good news and that good news is in the form of rainfall this week. Um, so just to start us off, uh, the map on the left shows the seven day precipitation totals from September 13th through 8 a.m. yesterday, September 19th. And this is really basically a map of the, the rainfall we saw over the weekend, so uh, Saturday into Sunday. And so you can see amounts weren't uh, too heavy. Here in Columbia, for example, we saw around a quarter of an inch, um, but there were certainly parts of the state that saw up to an inch, and a lot of these uh, rainfall totals fell in parts that were drought areas, and so that definitely needed this rainfall. Um, but we've really ramped up our chances for rainfall uh, beginning yesterday and, and really through the rest of the week. And so the map on the right are some Kokoraz 24-hour precipitation reports from this morning. Uh, so this is going to capture our rainfall totals from yesterday through this morning. And what we can see is, is really in southwest Missouri, pretty widespread rainfall event. And so uh, anywhere you see these dark blue circles over a half inch of rain, but really finding some isolated higher totals. So uh, McDonald County in the far southwest, uh, two to five inches of rain overnight. So they're actually in a flood warning right now. So um, so much needed rainfall, but actually maybe a little bit too much rainfall in a couple of those spots. And uh, depending on where you're you're coming to to us from and in, in the state, you might still be seeing some rainfall ongoing right now. Uh, so this is the rainfall from about 15 minutes ago showing the radar. And so we see clouds and, and some light shower activity across most of the state going on right now. And this is occurring because we've got a, an area of low pressure just to our southwest. It's pretty weak uh, and it's very slow moving, but ahead of that cold front or ahead of that area of low pressure, there's a stationary front that's kind of bringing warm, moist air in from the south. And so uh, because this low pressure is slow moving, we can actually expect the pattern we're seeing today really throughout the rest of the work week. So I would expect a pretty wet pattern with multiple rounds of showers and storms. It's not going to be an all-day soaker, um, but similar today, bring your umbrella, uh, cloudy days probably likely as well. Um, because of the rain, we'll, we'll see some pretty seasonal high temperatures, really looking at highs in the, the mid to upper 70s for the rest of the week. Um, lows a little bit warmer than usual because of that cloud uh, cover and rainfall kind of insulating our temperatures. So we'll really only drop down into the 60s for the rest of the week, which is a bit of a contrast because we've been having some cool, clear mornings uh, lately. And so I'm going to flip through here and just show 
Uh, these maps are, are kind of day by day forecasted rainfall totals. And so this map is for today. We see most of the states getting in on some kind of rainfall, but uh, the shower activity is pretty light. So uh, really just up to a quarter inch of rainfall and this map looks similar as I, I kind of click through the rest of the week here. So this is for tomorrow's rainfall, a little bit heavier in the western part of the state, so up to a half inch in, area, in those areas, but looks like almost everywhere should pick up at least a few showers. And same story on Friday as well. And so this is actually good because we've been drier than normal, and we're going to get this rainfall not in one quick thunderstorm where it all comes down at once, um, but really several uh, periodic light rain events, which will really allow that rainfall to infiltrate the soil and soak in pretty nicely. So, so we really needed an event like this. Um, this weekend, our rain chances continue, but I actually ex expect them to maybe become more organized with some thunderstorm activity. Uh, so there's not a lot of agreement on some of the timing right now, um, but it looks like late Saturday into Sunday morning, we could see uh, a cold front that you see here on the forecast map move across uh, the central U.S. and the state of Missouri. And so ahead of that cold front, we'll likely see temperatures warm up into the 80s on Saturday. And this is going to bring the risk of thunderstorms. And actually, uh, some of these storms could be severe. Uh, so here is the convective thunderstorm outlook from the Storm Prediction Center. So this is their day four outlook, which is going to run from 7 a.m. Saturday to 7 a.m. Sunday. And we see right now they're they're putting us in a 15% chance for uh, severe weather probabilities. And so this is mainly for a potential damaging wind event. And so I just wanted to highlight this because um, a day four risk from the Storm Prediction Center is relatively high. Uh, so I would urge you to just uh, check in on the weather forecast over the next few days and, and watch for that severe weather on Saturday into Sunday. I would expect this risk area to, to grow in size over the next few days and also see some higher probabilities as well. And so beyond this weekend, um, we expect, expect probably seasonal temperatures going into early next week. But beyond that, the forecast uncertainty is pretty high right now. Uh, there's a really active pattern in days one through five, and uh, models aren't quite agreeing into that. So once we get beyond that five-day period, uh, there's a lot of spread in what the forecast could be. So um, at this point, it's hard to pinpoint whether uh, early next week will be wet or dry, but the accumulation of all of these rainfall days that we're likely to see, uh, here's our, our seven-day rainfall accumulation forecast running from this Wednesday to next Wednesday, uh, and it's great to see uh, the possibility for widespread uh, two to three-inch rainfall amounts, especially for the western part of the state. And so this is extremely beneficial because if you look at some of the, the darker purples and the reds on this rainfall forecast map, they're actually kind of corresponding to our U.S. drought monitor map that shows extreme drought in west central Missouri. So seeing that heaviest rainfall uh, where the drought areas are occurring. And so hopefully this time next week, uh, we're looking at rainfall accumulations and not a forecast. And, and hopefully we see these totals pan out over the next week. Um, and just to, to show some context here, while this two to three inches of rainfall could be very beneficial for improving the drought, um, looking on the left, these are our six month precipitation departures from normal uh, for the state. And anywhere you see that red on the map, uh, looking at rainfall departures, uh, anywhere from nine to 15 inches below normal. So uh, while this, this rainfall event this week will help to chip into the drought, we actually still have a long ways to go uh, when we think about recovery from the deficits we've accumulated this year. And so uh, really quickly, I'll show the, the Climate Prediction Center outlooks for the next two weeks. And I'll also note that again, starting next week, there's a lot of uncertainty and not a lot of agreement between some of the forecast models, um, but there is some agreement as far as temperatures were expected over the next two weeks. Um, so starting really at the six to 10 days, but also getting out to 14 days, to see uh, above normal temperatures, um, but there's not a lot of confidence in the precipitation forecast. So really pointing towards near normal precipitation. This time of year, uh, our weekly average precipitation would probably be around three quarters of an inch. And so we see a, a similar picture here at the eight to 14, warmer and near normal precipitation is the forecast uh, for now. And so uh, it's good to see this forecast. It, possibly could be an end to our dry pattern from now. 
but we're also really starting to cool off. And so early I mentioned uh, that we were seeing some very cool nights lately. Um, so this table on the top left is from the Missouri Mesonet. It's our weekly summary going back to last Wednesday. And the extreme lows are the lowest temperatures that we were observing across the state in this past week. And you can see that several locations were, were hanging out in the middle 40s, which is uh, cooler than normal, and starting to get closer to that uh, frost point of 36 degrees Fahrenheit. So I did want to uh, pull out some climatological information and, and show our median date uh, for a frost date across the state of Missouri. And so this is kind of the average date when we expect uh, that frost to occur. And so you can see here uh, that northern tier of counties in, in northern Missouri, um, really uh, climatologically only a couple weeks away from where we might uh, start, be, start thinking about frost. Uh, central Missouri, uh, is maybe three weeks away from our typical first frost date. And as you get into uh, southeastern Missouri, where it's a little warmer, uh, that frost date's typically later in October. Um, the first freeze date follows a similar pattern, but really just pushed back a week. Um, so we would expect that that first freeze to occur in uh, the second week of October for those northern counties, middle October, middle to late October for central Missouri, and getting into November for southeastern Missouri here. And our, our hard freeze uh, below 28 degrees Fahrenheit, we typically don't see that towards the end of October, around Halloween and, and the start of November as well. And so I wanted to put this information out here. There's certainly nothing in the next two weeks in the forecast that's pointing towards an early frost. As we saw those maps, we're actually kind of expecting above normal temperatures. Um, but this is something we typically start thinking about this year is, is looking for that first frost and freeze. And so uh, just for fun, again, uh, this isn't in the forecast, but here's our, our earliest historical freeze dates we've seen at several sites. And so you can see it's not out of the realm of possibility uh, to see that first freeze in September. Uh, all of these locations have had some pretty early freezes historically, um, but it looks like we're going to get through the month of September without an early frost or freeze in the state of Missouri. And so uh, we are cooling off as well. So, so later this week, we're gonna enter uh, the official start of fall astronomically uh, with the uh, fall equinox as well. And so we're starting to really see our average uh, temperatures drop. Uh, so right now today in Columbia, our average high is 78.6 degrees, but by next week that's down to 76 and low temperatures are following the same trend. So we're really losing about a half degree of average temperature per day right now and cooling off. And we're also losing uh, quite a bit as far as our length of day. And so if you check the, the sunrise and sunset times, we're really losing about two to three minutes of daylight this time of year. So uh, getting into that fall season when a lot of changes are expected. And so um, that's all for today for our summary. Again, hopefully we see that rainfall this week. And if you all have any questions, here's my contact information. So thank you. Thank you, Zach. We greatly appreciate it. And we appreciate you being here and filling us in. And, and I know all of us are looking forward to having some precipitation. I know in my county, I'm, I'm in the yellow area where it's abnormally dry. And I just am looking forward to having that rain. Plus, it's nice to have rain after not having it for so long. It feels good in a roundabout way. So thank you for joining us each week. We, we appreciate it. What I'd like to do now is go ahead and switch gears, and I'm going to let Jennifer go ahead and be our moderator for today. So, Jennifer, let's get started. All right. Thank you, Debbie. And good afternoon, everyone. So our first question deals with leaves, and it is the time of year for trees to be turning color and starting to drop their leaves. The question is, with fall coming and all the leaves dropping from the trees, is it harmful to just let them lay on the ground where they fall? And Manoj is going to answer this question. Yep, thank you, Jennifer. Yes, so Jack brought us, brought us some wonderful news about rain and cooler weather. So we are finally into fall. Our landscape plants are really loving the weather we have right now. Uh, but after a month or so, we have some assignments to do on these fallen leaves. So before we go there, let's make a plan on how to best manage those uh, leaves in our yard. Again, just to start off, when we talk about uh, those leaves, so we think of a very traditional method of collecting them, wrecking them, 
bagging them up and sending to the uh, city uh, composting sites, right? Uh, but there are other alternatives that we can do other than uh, sending those precious uh, materials. Actually, these leaves, they have a very high, um, uh, very high useful materials for us in the, that can be used in garden, particularly the organic matter. They are not very rich in nutrients like nitrogen, but they are very high in carbon. And that carbon or organic matter is very much uh, essential to have a good soil health overall. So to harvest that nutrients, what we can do is, uh, many of you might have practiced this, uh, to chop them out, shred them using a lawnmower. Just run the lawnmower. If it is um, the, the leaves are falling on your grass yard, then you can use lawnmowers. Or if you if it is on your perennial beds, then you can collect them um, near your grass grass yard and then run the mower so that it can chop it down. And when you shred those leaves into smaller pieces, it will help naturally to filter that um, leaves litter into the turf canopy and it will naturally add that uh, organic matter. But if it is under flower beds or trees or perennial uh, landscape, then you can just leave them alone. Uh, if, if you want, you can chop them, you can collect them in a, in a barrel and use some shredders or even leaf whacker to chop them into tiny pieces and then put them back into the flower bed or you can also leave them alone. Um, just uh, it, there, it has more chances to get blown away if it is larger size and also the amount of time it takes to decompose is slightly longer if it is a bigger size. So if you break them down, it will it will decompose faster. So that's the advantage of uh, shredding those leaves. Um, so I, I would recommend to leave those uh, and mulch your flower beds and even shrubs and trees. And your mulching, as we know, has a lot of advantages, particularly weed suppressions, modifications of uh, extreme temperatures, protection from frost and freeze and things like that. When it comes to vegetable garden, if you have a leaves in a vegetable garden, I would suggest you actually till those into the ground uh, because chances are they will get blown away by the wind. And so you won't get uh, much advantage by just uh, leaving it there. So if you can, so fall is the best time to till them again. If you till them in the ground, then, um, then it will be ready to uh, plant actually in the coming spring. You can also put those leaves in the compost bean, um, just the traditional composting, uh, because uh, you might know for the compost, you need a brown matter and green matter. So green matters are basically your uh, kitchen waste, food scraps, uh, green grass clippings and things like that. But the brown matter, which is more rich in carbon. So those you get from your um, brown leaves and twigs and branches. So if you can collect those and put it in your compost bin, that's a very uh, ideal way of using those as a compost. Another thing I wanna highlight is about um, this, um, this practice really uh, picking up in recent years is leaving the leaves in fall. And what this is about, uh, if you have a um, flower beds uh, or, or non-grassed area, then you can leave those leaves as it is so that it will provide uh, the optimum conditions for your um, different beneficial invertebrates, including butterflies and spiders, mites, uh, that can find a good shelter on them. And um, natural, naturally, they will have, they will have more um, balancing in the ecosystems by not disturbing their shelter. And you can, I mean, if it, is, if it is too thick, like more than two inch, then that can become thick and from a mat, uh, so to, you want to avoid that deep layer, but if you have just less than inch, then that will be a wonderful practice to maintain your um, or manage your leaf liters. And if you have less than an inch, then actually it won't affect any of your perennial plants, but would help. But if it is more than more than two inch, then you might want to uh, move that around because it might it might just cause more um, suffocation and restricted air movement on your perennials beds. So that will be all for uh, how to best manage the fallen leaves. Thank you, Manoj. The next question is, I have two poinsettias sitting on my back deck, and when I water them, there are always a lot of ants that start moving out of the pots. 
They don't seem to be hurting the plants, but how do I get rid of the ants before I bring the plants in for winter? And Kathy is going to answer this question. Can you see the uh, slide okay, D Jennifer? Yes, I can. All right, thank you. So first thing you want to do is, of course, inspect your plants before moving them indoors. And there it's a lot of different uh, uh, critters that could be uh, hiding. There could be flying, walking, scale insects. There could be cocoons, snails, earthworms, uh, insects like spider mites, aphids, and ants can invade the, the plant soil, leaves and soil. And so, like I said, this could be uh, flying, walking, uh, just a lot of different insects that could invade uh, your plants. So one of the first things you can do is if the plant is small enough, you could set it down in a bucket of lukewarm water and the eggs and the insects will just float out. And this will save you a lot of headaches if you do this now and not wait until uh, you've moved the plant inside and you end up with an infestation of something you don't want. After you do that, you can either repot the plant or you can um, just add some fresh soil uh, around the pot as needed. Uh, if your plants are too big for the bucket, you can spray them um, with water to remove dust and any soft bodied insects. You can spray off even the small ones. You could start with that actually. Um, inspect the leaves and stems for insects or eggs, especially on the underside of the leaves. Wipe down the tops and underside of the leaves and look near the bottom of the container, especially for ants. They like to crawl in that drainage hole and start pulling soil out and taking it other places or just you know, making a nest there. Uh, if the indoor plants are in the soil and you're going to be digging them up, look real carefully for earthworms. You don't want to bring those in like I mentioned earlier. And you could, if, if this doesn't work, um, you can try an insecticidal soap that can be used for soft bodied insects, but read the label, make sure that it is um, not going to harm the plant or that it is being, it is labeled for what you are trying to control. You can also do a systemic insecticide drench. If you do this, you wanna use it outside and um, that insecticide will move up the canopy um, in time for the eggs that are hatching. And then the juvenile insects won't be able to establish on a treated plant, won't be able to become established. So again, read the label. Always start uh, with the water method, spraying them down, wiping the leaves down and the stems. And then um, the soaking in the lukewarm water is a good method to use. And I hope that helps. I will say, because it was on poinsettias and I didn't show any poinsettia pictures, I do wanna say that poinsettias are a short day plant and they need about 13 hours of uninterrupted darkness each day. And if you have uh, had one survive this summer and you were bringing it back in and you would like to try to uh, force it to bloom, so uh, in late September, you can set the poinsettia in a dark closet every evening at sunset and then remove it from the closet the following morning at sunrise. You could also place a lightproof hood over the plant and um, at, dawes, at dusk and then remove it in the morning. I tried a, a cardboard box one time and um, it, it worked pretty well. I, I will say that um, Without ideal conditions, it is hard to get them as pretty as they are when we're purchasing them in November and December. But in case anyone wants to do this, there is more information on our website. And again, I'm happy, I or another horticulture specialist is happy to talk to you about it. And that's all I have, Jennifer. Thank you, Kathy. A the question next... came in. Jennifer, I'm sorry, a question came in. When soaking, do you soak both the root ball and the plant canopy? That's a very good question. And actually, uh, I should have put in there, you soak it for about 20 minutes. And so no, you're soaking the, um, the root ball 
for the 20 minutes. It, depending on the plant, is probably not going to hurt it to just dunk it down in the water a little bit and clean those leaves off. But uh, it's the root ball where the insects are, and that's what you're trying to get rid of. And again, for about 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. The next question is, I would like to try leaf mulching this year instead of just chopping up the leaves with a lawnmower. What is the best way to actually make leaf mulch? I have quite a few old oak and black walnut trees. Would the leaf mulch be toxic to any plants? And Manoj is going to answer this. Yes, Jennifer. So this was actually a, a same questions we have broken down into multiple parts. Uh, so another part of this question was, how, what, is the, what is the alternative way of managing leaf liters? Um, so when we call, talk about mulch, there are different terms actually, and that might confuse some people. Uh, let's first tackle that. So mulch is just adding a layer of vegetative materials, whether it's a, a leaves or it's compost, it's a leaf mold, whatever you add, you can just add to provide protections, to suppress weeds, just to cover the ground or the um, plants. That's what we call mulch. You can mulch with compost. You can mulch with just the uh, straight leaves. You can mulch with leaf mold. Uh, it just depends whatever you want to use. Uh, but I think the client want to know about what's the best way to compost or make leaf mold. So these are two different terms again, leaf compost and leaf molds. So leaf compost or generally in compost, when we say that is made by adding the layers of brown and green matter. When I say brown matter, that is the dry leaves generally, uh, or clipboards or newspapers, uh, those type of stuffs belongs to brown matter or straw. They are rich in carbon and they provide a good balance for composting or decomposing that green matter. So green matter is grass clippings and green leaves or a yard waste, which are green. So when you make a compost, for example, in a compost bean, then we add these alternative layers of brown and green matter. So when you do that, then we call that compost. Of course, it takes anywhere from six months to one year or even two years, depending on how big of a pile you have, how much material you put, how much, how often you turn that and what, what uh, and the moistures and temperatures and all those conditions uh, will depend, will, will factor in and how, how early you can uh, have this finished compost. And the finished compost is the earthy, smelly materials, uh, which crumbles finely like a, like, a, like a dirt in your hands. And you can use that as a mulch at a thin layer. Also, you can use as a fertilizer. And another thing is called leaf mold. So this leaf mold is the same thing as compost, but here, but here we don't add any brown, any other materials. We only add leaves. So it's 100% leaves. If you compost the 100% leaves, the product that we get is called leaf mold. And the purpose of doing this leaf mold is different uh, because this at the end of the uh, preparation, what we get is a very finely uh, dirt uh, that has, that works like a sponge. Actually, this is more similar like a peat moss or, or, or the materials that you use to fill in your pots. And, and you can actually use this finished leaf mold uh, to, uh, to fill your pots and other uh, flower beds as well, like you do with the peat moss. Uh, so the main difference is what you put in and what, what do you want to use that for? Generally, with the leaf mold, you can get a very high water holding capacity. The media that holds excessive amount, a very good amount of water, water retention, and, and if you are doing uh, you know, very drought conditions or if you didn't have a good irrigation, then that's a very good strategy to prepare leaf mold and use that in your flower bed, in your vegetable garden. And even, even you can use that in your lawns uh, if you have enough. Okay, so that's what about this leaf mold versus leaf compost. And uh, the question, another part of the question was, can I use the leaves from oak trees and black walnut trees? Um, sometimes people might get a little bit worried about oak tree leaves because it has uh, the dry leaves are especially more acidic in nature and might be concerned for might be uh, 
concern for some some people but when this it when these leaves get decomposed into these fine materials uh, the ps of that product is going to be get corrected itself so it will be more a neutral product at the end of the day so you don't have to be too much worried about this acidic uh, nature of these oak leaves and for the black walnut and other um, like a pecan leaves, people are worried about this allelopathic effect, which is um, because of the pro because of the chemical called jerglon. That's the natural toxins this walnut trees releases, and because of that, some people are concerned about if it's gonna affect my um, perennial or garden crops. The matter, the 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 reality is the amount of these toxin chemicals jerglon in these dry leaves and, and your stems and branches is very, very minimal. So the chances of getting this in a, in a significant amount and affecting your plant health is very minimal. So you don't have to be worried about using those leaves uh, and mulching them or composting them uh, because of this allelopathic effect of black walnut trees. So please go ahead and use uh, your oak and black walnut leaves uh, for sure. That's all from me. Back to you, Jennifer. Okay, thank you, Manoj. I am now going to talk about insects. And Manoj, can you see this? Yes. Okay. So what I would like to do is have the audience identify some different insects I have. And I have about, I either have six or seven insects. And I'd like you to put in the chat what you think the insects are. And Manoj is going to read out loud any of the answers. So take a few seconds and put your answer in the chat. What do you think these insects are? You asking for the names, right? Just the common name, okay. the common name. What is this insect? And when you see some answers, let me know. Okay, some answers coming in. Milkweed bog. Box elder, house subogs. Okay, we'll stop there. Well, someone is correct. They are milkweed bugs. All right, so last Thursday, during our master pollinator field session up in Putnam County near Unionville, we were walking through a prairie and saw a lot of these milkweed bugs congregated on some milkweed plants. And they are in uh, different stages of their life cycle, as you can see here in the photos. Some of them are in the adult stage. And then in the middle, you see some of these insects are in the nymph stage. And they are pretty much harmless to milkweed. You know, you don't need to do anything. If you see them, just leave them alone. They're not gonna really hurt the plants. So they're just doing their thing as milkweed bugs. Just, just leave them on the milkweeds. Identify this one. Put your answer in the chat. Yeah, I didn't see anyone, anything coming. It Nothing yet. This one's a little harder and I will tell you it is a true bug. If you look at this one, you will see the scutellum, which is this triangular area right here on its back. Bean and I will beetles. tell you it is in the stink bug family, but it's not a stink bug. Comments are bean beetles, cucumber beetle. Okay, I will give you the answer. Oh, it looks like, okay, so I thought it was going to come up on the screen. It is a harlequin bug. So this is a harlequin bug. Maybe you've heard of this, maybe you haven't. <clears throat> this is an insect that is in the stink bug family, and it will feed on a variety of different plants. And it tends to favor the plants uh, like broccoli, cauliflower, turnips. So you might see them on those plants. You can use insecticidal soap. You can use uh, pyrethrin to control them. But I would also encourage you to think about companion planting. These insects are repelled by very strong aromatic herbs. 
So if you like to grow herbs or into companion planting, you might consider putting some of those uh, among those plants um, that they favor if you've had problems with this insect. Let's move on to the next one. So identify this one, put the answer in the chat. Do we have any answers? Lightning bug. Lightning bug, okay. This one is a soldier beetle. And right now, if you go out and look at the goldenrod, you will probably find a lot of soldier beetles on the goldenrod plants. And in the center of this slide, there is a soldier beetle on a basil plant. So I went out here at the Adair County Extension Center yesterday and I was out there looking for soldier beetles and I found one not only on the goldenrod, but on the basil. But right now they, they tend to be all over the goldenrod and they uh, are you know, collecting nectar, getting nectar, drinking nectar and uh, pollen uh, from the flowers. They are not hurting the flowers. So this is an insect that you do not need to worry about, don't need to do anything. Just leave them alone and they will, you know, go about their business on the golden rod and they will not hurt it. And they're really not hurting the basil either. Identify these insects. This one is easy. Squash bug. And that is correct. These are squash bug nymphs. So notice how they have light gray bodies. They even in the pictures, they look as if they are a soft bodied insect in this stage. So they're not quite yet to the hard, more hard shelled adult stage, which is, which is a darker gray or darker brown. And in that adult stage, they're a little harder to control. So here at the extension office, we use a lot of marigolds, we use basil, we have uh, uh, several other types of herbs um, scattered uh, among our plants. And I don't think this is actually from here. I'm not sure where I got this photo at, but it's a good photo to show you the nymphs. Um, you can also uh, yeah, use, use py pyrethrin or permethrin to control these, but these are bad. We don't want to, uh, we really don't want to see these. And I usually don't have them in very high numbers here at the extension office. And I think that is because I do a lot of companion planting. Zenny, for a question came in for the squash bugs uh, asking, what can I do now to reduce them next year? So you want to be sure you remove all of your plants when the garden is done for the season. We make a burn pile here and we burn all of our plants. I don't compost. I really don't compost any anything with like any, I don't compost uh, corn, green beans, anything that's real thick, uh, kind of woody. But I also never compost any cucurbit plants because the cucurbits usually have cucumber beetles or you know cucumber beetle eggs, the squash bug, squash bug eggs. So we want to have good sanitation in our garden. You know, right now most of us are done or tired of zucchini and cucumbers and other types of squashes. Um, but if you did have a, a problem and you want to spray, permethrin is a insecticide that is recommended for control of squash bugs. So I would look for a, a product at your local garden center containing permethrin. At this point, it's too late for companion planting. And then the key next, you know, for next year is to try to get all the insect or all the debris cleaned up so you don't have any insects overwintering, any adults overwintering in garden debris. Okay. But my experience is you can do all the cleaning and sanitation you want in your garden and you're still going to have them each year. We just don't have very high numbers. I think it's because we do that, do these practices. Moving on, identify this insect. Hornet, another hornet. Okay. Honeybee. All right, so take a look at the abdomen. There are no hairs on this insect and it does look like a hornet but it is a cicada killer wasp. It is 
pretty much harmless to humans. Uh, it rarely stings. What it does is parasitizes cicadas, and then it takes it back to the nest and it feeds it to its young. So it is a ground nesting wasp and it is, so it's, it's not gonna be like in a hive. So you'll find it probably with a nest in the ground, you'll see a hole in the ground and you may even see it drag a cicada uh, into a hole. But it's taking the cicada to its young uh, or, or, or it takes it in there. I've also read where it will lay eggs on the cicada, they hatch and they feed on, on that cicada. So that is what it does. Um, but it for us, for humans, it's pretty much harmless. So, you know, but anytime you aggravate any wasp, hornets, bees, yes, you're probably going to get stung. Or if you stop accidentally stop on them, you're probably going to get stung. But you know, if they're not bothering you and you're not near it and you, you know, you're not bothering it, it, it's most likely going to leave you alone. I believe this is our last one. What is this insect? Web, webworm, bagworm, fall webworm, another webworm. Well, those that said fall webworm would, would be correct. So this is the fall webworm and you will start seeing, if you haven't already, you will start seeing uh, webs on the outer periphery of trees. And in the adult stage, it is a moth, like you see in the upper right hand corner there. In the larva stage, it is these hairy worms and they are in the bag, not the bags, they're in the webs. So if you were to break open those webs, you would see these hairy uh, caterpillars in there. And that's actually what's recommended is if you can reach the webs in the trees, just take a broom or something and break the webs loose and then let the caterpillars fall to the ground and birds uh, will likely come and eat the caterpillars. And if they are on a very large mature tree, uh, you probably don't need to worry about it. It's not going to hurt or kill the tree. Uh, these insects will feed on the leaves that they make the web around, but it's not going to uh, really hurt or kill your tree. And bagworms, some people do call these bagworms. These are not bagworms. These are, this is the fall webworm. A bagworm is that little diamond shaped uh, structure. It's uh, usually about one to two inches. That's a bag and the worm is inside that. And so we call that the bag worm. So quite a bit of difference between the two insects. And that's all I have. Thank you, Manoj, for uh, helping me. Okay, now Kathy is going to talk about selecting and caring for chrysanthemums. All right, chrysanthemums. And I will probably just refer to them as mums as, we, as I go through this. And they are a short day plant. So they flower in response to the length of the day versus the length of the night. And as the days become shorter in late summer, you'll see the flower buds form. And when Kathy, the days, yes. I'm sorry, but we're not seeing your presentation. Oh, okay. Well, let me shut it and start again then. Now, oh, now? No. Okay. Let me make sure I'm still sharing. That may be the problem. Hmm. Oh, there it is. Yes, we can see it now. Okay. Then it's in the right view? No. Okay. How about that? Yes. Okay. So uh, as I move on, I'll refer to these as mums probably. So um, they are a short day plant and it, the, they, uh, as the days become shorter in the summer, the flower buds form. And then when the days become even shorter, the bud develops and blooms. 
Um, so there are, I just wanted to quickly mention, there are garden moms and florist moms. And sometimes I see these florist moms sold at the same time and people think they are getting a hardy mom when indeed they're not. And so florist moms are sold throughout the year and usually at floral shops, supermarkets, you know, or other retailers. And most florist moms will not survive our winters. And but the garden moms are more cold hardy than the florist moms. And that's what you're seeing at the nurseries and uh, different stores around. And um, from what I understand, it's a very nice crop this year. So when you're choosing moms, they uh, you want to look for vibrant colors and healthy foliage. Uh, if you choose ones that have the tightly closed buds, um, then you've got a little time before they're going to bloom. If you choose one that's kind of already bloomed out or halfway bloomed out, that bloom isn't going to last as long. So while you're looking at what deciding what color to buy or what flower type to buy, you're also going to be able to look at early, mid, and late season. And often they are marked. Um, and again, they're just like the, what it says, early, mid, and late season. If you choose a late season one, it's going to bloom later in the season. And if you choose an early one, again, it's going to bloom earlier and it's going to bloom out probably, possibly, um, before you want it to. So just be aware of that and, and look at those factors of when you're buying and when you're wanting the most bloom. When you're uh, looking at them, make sure that, um, again, that you've got healthy foliage and you don't see any insects on it, does, uh, yellow or diseased leaves, just leave those plants alone. They, uh, when you buy them, sometimes, I haven't seen this too often, in the container there's no drainage hole or there's foil, uh, the plant is wrapped in foil. If that's the case, make sure you poke holes in the containers or repot it into a different container that does have drainage holes and remove the foil. That foil is pretty, but it does, it is, it's, uh, can hold the moisture in uh, that you don't want. Um, some people uh, buy them just and treat them just like an annual and they are not planted in the ground, maybe not even put in another decorative pot. They're just placed around the yard and that's just fine. Um, however, those plants have been in those pots for quite a while and there is uh, not as much soil as there is root matter oftentimes. And so you wanna make sure that those plants don't dry out and because they will dry out very quickly. So you may, you probably will have to water every day, maybe, maybe, maybe every other day. Um, you can move these. If you still wanna treat them as an annual, you could put them in a different container. Um, a decorative pot or a little bit larger container and just fill it with um, potting soil and it won't be as critical to check for water, but it'll still be critical. If you're going to use them as perennials, you want to plant it in the full sun where it receives at least six to eight hours of sunlight. Also, they want fertile, well-drained soil, high in organic matter. Mulch the plant is also very good to protect it in the winter and help retain moisture in the uh, spring and summer. If you are transplanting this uh, plant this year, uh, again, you're going to need to make sure that you water regularly. That soil ball can dry out quickly. And uh, which brings me to another um, thing about the our, so our clay soils. These moms were grown in really good uh, high organic uh, mixture. And if you do not amend the soil at all, and you just put it in our clay soils that have not been amended, uh, often that will prevent uh, good establishment and you could lose the plant. Every few years, you may need to divide it. And then also to keep them blooming, pinch off new growth from about six inches tall in, in, until early June. So when the plants, oh, I don't know, six or eight inches tall, um, you can start pinching it back. And you're, what you're doing is actually pinching off the blooms because you don't want the plant to start forming it bud, its buds yet. 
And uh, a rule of thumb that we go by is to stop pinching uh, July 4th. And it's just an easy date to remember. And, and that's why we use that date. Uh, you want to pinch off the top half to one inch of new growth every four weeks during the summer. And um, that will allow the uh, mom to branch and, and bloom well as a result of that. Um, and just uh, uh, last thing, water the plant at the soil line if it's in a container or in the ground. Uh, don't overhead, don't water it overhead. This will help prevent splitting and breaking of the branches. That Those branches on mums can break. Um, you can see it sometimes at the nursery. You'll see where they're already splitting, um, not necessarily from in, uh, from, uh, uh, not watering correctly, but just because the plant has gotten gotten so large. But again, water at the soil line to help prevent that from happening. And that's all I have. Thanks, Jennifer. Yes, thank you, Kathy. And now Debbie's going to tell us about drying flowers. Yeah, this is fun and exciting when it comes to um, drying flowers simply because we get to see them nice and pretty in the summer and early spring or late fall depending upon what kind of flowers you've got um, but you know soon they disappear and so drying flowers is a way to keep them they may not be as vibrant in color but it's a great way to be able to keep some of those beautiful flowers that you've grown throughout this throughout the growing season so let's look at this um when we're looking at drying, there are a couple of different methods of doing it. And I'll go real quickly through some of these different methods. And then Manoj is going to drop into the chat box a fabulous extension publication that we've created. And it's going to give you a list of different flowers that are good for each of these different methods for growing. So air layering and Jennifer uh, gave me this particular uh, picture because she's been doing the lavender research trials and she uh, is drying a lot of lavender. So you want to cut them at a length that you would like to have them as a cut flower. You want to turn them so that they're all tied together and you can see they're using rubber bands here. You want to hang them upside down in a warm, dry location and do that for several weeks. It's best for flowers that don't easily wilt. So if you cut flowers and put them in vases in the summer, and by the time you've gathered what you want and you go inside and they, some of them look like they're starting to already wilt, those are ones that probably need to be dried in a different fashion. If for some reason the stems are weak, you can go ahead and use a florist wire to help you know stick it into the base of the flower head and then kind of twist it around every so often around that stem and then go ahead and dry them upright. And that will help to keep that flower with a weak stem to stand up straight. Another technique, which we probably all did as kids was pressing flowers. Um, it's fast, they dry faster. Sorry about my spelling there. They dry faster and they also have a better color retention when you do this particular method. You wanna use some sort of porous materials such as facial tissues. You can use newspaper or regular paper or tissue paper, for example, that uh, you might put in wrapping gifts and things like that, but you don't want the non-glossy paper. You wanna go ahead and lay those flowers uh, as flat as you can, such as what you're seeing here. These are already pressed in this picture, but lay the flowers out how you might like them and go ahead and cover them with that same material. And then you can go ahead and put them uh, in books, um, inside of books, close those books, stack up books, uh, so that those are going to actually have some time in there. After about a week, you wanna go ahead and open them up, go ahead and replace that tissue or paper, laying them in the same fashion as what you did the first time, go ahead and put them back in that book, um, and then go ahead and stack some more books on top of uh, those that you're trying to press. And probably in the next couple of weeks after that, you should have some really nice, colorful dried flowers. Another one is to use desiccants. And a desiccant is usually used when you have a flower that has a lot of moisture in it. Uh, because if it has a lot of moisture and you use 
air air drying or if you use uh, pressing in a book, they have a tendency to misshape when they're being in that drying process. So what you want to do is use a desiccant. Um, that desiccant is going to help to dry out and take, pull that moisture away from those flowers and the stems. There are two things that you could use, borax with sand or cornmeal, or you can use silica gel. You can use this on all kinds of flowers, not just the high moisture flowers, but any of them. And then depending upon what you want to do with that dried flower, you might want to consider using florist wire and wiring some of those up. So for example, in this picture here, you can see what they've done uh, with roses that they would like to keep and dry. And then also with this daisy type of a flower where it actually, the wire will go straight up through the middle of that stem out the top, bend it over, and then push it back down through that middle flower center head and back down through the stem. And then this way you can keep that desiccant, uh, the, the flowers are then within and inside that desiccant. Another thing you can do is microwave dry your flowers. Um, this is really quick, really fast. You want to use silica gel. Make sure you always use a microwave safe container. And you also want to take at least one cup of water and put that in the microwave separate from the bowl or container where you've got the silica and the flowers that you want to dry. Um, I read through, I don't remember off the top of my head why you want to add that one cup of water there. I think really what it is is to add at least a little bit of moisture to the atmosphere so the flowers don't dry out um, too far along. You want to keep a little bit in there while it's in that drying drying phase. Drying times can vary depending upon the size of the flower or the moisture content of that flower, anywhere from one to three minutes. Um, it's best not, it's not the best method for drying if you have really, really thick petals on those flowers. So think about what flowers are best to use. After you've gone through that drying of that one to three minutes, you want to leave it in that container leave it in that silica gel because it's going to be really, really hot. And you want to let it set to cool for about 12 to 24 hours. Once they're dried, to help keep that flower, even though it's dried, it still can absorb moisture from the atmosphere. So you can use a hairspray on it or you can use a, a lacquer on it to try to prevent moisture from getting into that particular flyer, fly, flower that you did uh, drying in the microwave. And then something that I was not familiar with, and I learned as I was going through um, this process of putting this presentation together, on drying foliage, I've tried to do that in the past, and I just was not very successful with it. Uh, you want to take branches that are about 18 inches long that has the foliage on it that you would like to keep. You do want to remove the lower leaves on that, and then you want to crush that stem end so that it has more surface area because you're going to put it in a container of one part glycerin to two parts warm water and let them stand in as if you're, you've got cut flowers in there. Uh, they're going to absorb that water and glycerin uh, within 24 hours. You want to go ahead and refill it back up to that same line that you originally had with that, that material. But when you add back in that material, that liquid, you want to use one part glycerin to four parts warm water. And then it would take about one to three weeks for the fullness of this to actually take place. So you may want to uh, continue to add that water to that main line of where you started at on that first time. This top picture up here is showing you the glycerin as it's moving into the 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 leaves and the stem. And what it actually is going to do then when it's completed is the plant material you have there is actually going to be a solid brown or a solid gray color. This looks like it might be eucalyptus. You can see oak leaves in the back. So this is going to add that dry foliage to a dry arrangement that you might make as you're drying flowers, or if you're going to be making wreaths where you can add in some of this different foliage to add some variety to what you've got there. And that's what I've got. Okay, we are out of time. So Debbie, you can wrap us up now. All righty. 
So we just want to say thank you for joining us. And for some reason, I lost that one. Um, so I just want to say thanks a lot for joining us. We're always happy to have you with us. And um, I guess I accidentally closed the PowerPoint for... Okay, let me open it back up again real quick. Sorry, guys. Computer's taking a minute to think about it. All right, so here I have it. So um, then it helps if I actually pull up the right one. None of this kind of stuff happens to you guys out there in Zoom land, does it? Okay, so um, we just want to say thanks a lot for joining us. We're always happy to have you with us. Remember that we have live streaming. Uh, so you can go to youtube.com slash MUIPM, Missouri University Integrated Pest Management. And then you'll find these pictures that look like this. And this is going to be the full live stream on the YouTube channel for all the ones that we've done. So if you've missed one, you'd like to go back and listen to it again. Uh, you didn't start joining us until this year. We have them from last year as well. So you're welcome to go back and watch those. Each week, we also pick one of the topics where we feel like it was either a timely discussion or a great presentation. And so we'll make that into a snippet. So under the home horticulture one right here, you'll see these little small types of, of um, presentations and that's what we call our snippets so you can go back and search for that uh, if you're looking for something in particular maybe we've already answered it and that that little snippets out there for you to watch so in the future as I mentioned in the beginning next week is our last weekly garden hour then we will move to monthly so October 18th October 15th so if you like to follow us go ahead and um, mark your calendars it's always the third Wednesday of the month, and we're happy to have you. If you have a question you'd like to ask um, during those monthly times, and even for next week, go ahead back out where you registered in order to get an email every Wednesday morning to remind you about the town hall or the, the garden hour. So here is ipm.missouri.edu forward slash, and it says town halls, and that's because we originally called this a town hall. And you can go ahead and subscribe once again. You'll only get one, but one email, but there's a place to upload pictures. And we always love to see the pictures because they help us to identify lots of things. If you want to save the information that's in the chat box, in your chat, you can go ahead and click on those three dots there. Right click on it. It'll ask you to save the chat box and you can save it to anywhere that you might like on your computer itself. Again, here is the map for those of us that are out across the state and our email addresses, and we're happy to have you with us. Sorry, we've gone a little long, and thank you. <laughs>